All right. Um, another thing to help me sync up the audio tracks is I'm going to count to three and everybody's going to clap. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah, that was a lot of claps. <laughs> Richard, I'm going to die. Let's start over. Can we start with Tom's, Tom's ping pong joke? That would be artificial. Do you know what I read in the news recently? What? Familiar with Snuggies? Snuggies are not a robe. Snuggies are neither garments nor priestly vestments. Why does this matter, guys? Uh, because the tariff rate for blankets is roughly half of the import tariff rate for garments. What about robes? Well, robes are garments. Okay, gotcha. So the uh, United States Court of International Trade, don't tell Donald Trump we have one of those, It they said that Snuggies are blankets. Rich, can you explain what a Snuggie is? Yeah, I would love to actually explain what a Snuggie is. Can, can I, before you do that, can I tell you a fact? Sure. Please. We should have at least one fact per show. Go ahead, Tom. This is the fact that we utter during this show. In my closet, there is a Snuggie for a St. Louis Cardinals themed. Yeah, it's okay. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. It's just a St. Louis Cardinals themed Snuggie. Never taken out of the box. Why do you have that? Yeah, why do you have that? I, I think um, now, maybe almost a decade ago, probably more like half a decade ago, I won it in some competition and I've never... Um, gotten rid of it tom can i ask you a serious question yes are you sure you didn't lose the competition i i <laughs> it's too sure. okay so uh can i explain what a snuggie is snuggies are blankets no 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 no. snuggies are robes uh, no, no no they're not robes Ruchik, keep up the, snuggies are blankets if they were this, robes the import tariff would be almost double can i tell you guys about another important trade case that was uh was an impact in my personal life yeah yeah, yeah. so uh about a hundred and some odd years ago uh the supreme court ruled on whether a tomato was a vegetable or a fruit and the reason that it? matters well hold on a second the reason that it matters for my personal life is because steph uh at the time just someone i was courting um now my wife and I had a big argument because she said she liked all vegetables, but apparently did not like tomatoes. And I said, well, you can't, you can't say that you like all vegetables if you don't like tomatoes. And it turns out that I was wrong. And according to the Supreme Court, actually, no, I was right. The Supreme Court says that a tomato is a vegetable for trade purposes. And so as lawyers, we must obey what the Supreme Court says. I think that precedent is ripe for being overturned. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Do you want to know? Do you want to play everything we know about the current Supreme Court session? Oh yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a topic we discussed uh, in in going through some of the cases that the Supreme Court is hearing right now and uh, making predictions. So uh, we're going to hold ourselves accountable to these predictions uh, when the case is decided. Tom, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Will there be public flogging or some sort of punishment if we're wrong? It'll just be embarrassment, you know, if you don't get it right. We'll kind of use the ta classic tactic of shame, I guess, huh? Tom, I, I need to tell you something. I don't, I don't feel embarrassment. Well, you'll have to force yourself. Okay. Well, okay. So let's, let's, let's explain what we're doing here. So Tom has gone and found uh, a handful of cases from the current Supreme Court session and Richard and I have committed not to learning about this ahead of time. And what we're going to do is Tom is going to summarize the case for us. And Richard and I are going to try to figure out what the outcome will be. And then if we get it right, uh, you know, that is really amazing. And people all around the world genuinely should take a moment out of their lives and pause in reflection on really what a great job Richard and I did. But on the other hand, if Richard and I turn out to have been wrong, then the thing to do would be for us to delete the podcast from iTunes. I think that's an accurate and fair summary. All right, are you ready? Let's do this. So the first case I have is Lee versus Tam. Oh, and... I'm going with Tam. Okay, 
Well, uh, the issue in this case is can you trademark, Tam is the guy that is opposing this mark, but can you trademark something that disparages people, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols? The plaintiff in this case wants to trademark the word slants for his band, and uh, the United States uh, says, well, no, you shouldn't be able to trademark that because that's offensive against folks of Asian American descent. So there's there's a statute on this, right? There there actually is a statute that says you can't trademark, you can't have offensive marks. So what what is the what's the argument? The 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 argument is that statute is unconstitutional because it's a a prior restraint on uh, free speech. Uh, the argument from the government is that the government shouldn't be forced to do something or put its seal of approval on something that it doesn't want to. And that's the brief summary of that case. That sounds totally bogus. Tom, can I ask a question? Yeah. Did the Washington Redskins submit an amicus brief on behalf of or on to supporting the guy who wants to trademark the term sin? We don't we don't use that word on our podcast, would you? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Slants or Redskins? I'm having a real hard time right now. You know, the Redskins would be uh, would be subject to this as well, right? Because one could argue that the term Redskin is something that the government obviously does not want to promote, is uh, is hateful, and so on and so forth. Sure. So there are groups that have asked the Patent and Trade Office to revoke the Redskins trademark. And I think the Redskins trademark was revoked for a time period, and they got it back or something. I forget exactly the background, but I think it was this law that uh, the plaintiffs in the Redskins case used to um, uh, to end their trademark. It, it might be that they no longer have a mark on that on Redskins, but um, you know they still use it. They're still big. So the the speech argument to me is a hundred percent bogus, and here's why: the Constitution says in I think it's in in Article One says that the Congress will will provide for the creation and and the protection of uh, intellectual property rights. And that that the the entire intellectual property scheme in the United States is a prior restraint on uh, First Amendment rights of speech and association, right? So you have a patent on some sort of product, and you and other people who don't license it from you are not allowed to um, participate in in selling or marketing that product. Copyright would be an even more straightforward example, right, AJ? Yeah. I mean, if you have, if you have a copyright on a work, then other people have a prior restraint under threat of civil and criminal penalties from performing that work. And so the, the entire intellectual property scheme exists outside of our ordinary framework for what we think of as ordinary speech rights, right? So uh, you, you could imagine a situation where it would be totally ridiculous to say that the government that, that, that this scheme that exists totally outside of First Amendment rights is somehow susceptible to First Amendment challenges like the ones here, right? So, right, like the, the government can prevent people from using a trade, uh, from violating the trademark for the New York Times, and that's a, not a prior restraint on speech, but I have a right to use racial slurs in my marketing materials. That's a First Amendment right, right? Like you, I mean, you can still use the word slant. When you market your products, you just don't get exclusive property rights to using that trademark. Yeah, and that's the government's argument, basically. So I think, uh, let me disagree almost entirely with AJ. Rooch, before you go on, so AJ, do you think that the Supreme Court will uh, decide in favor of the government in this case? So let's, let's do two things. Let's, let's do outcome and vote split. So I'm going to say an 8-1 in favor of the government. Well, that assumes there's nine justices. I'm going to say there might be one dissenter, but whatever it is, it's going to be seven or eight to one in favor of the government. I'm going to predict a unanimous decision against the government. And here is uh, sort of my reasoning for it, which is that the the government is basically, I, while I kind of see AJ's argument, I think the, maybe the bigger or different issue is, is that the government can basically, they can basically discriminate against the speaker you know, based on whether or not they agree with the content of the speech. So they can say that, like, you know, if not for the content of your speech, we believe that you have the full protection of trademark laws. But we've decided that because we don't like your speech, you do not have the full protection 
of trademark laws. And so we, the government, are going to decide whether something is a racial slur or inappropriate or so on and so forth. Rich, one yeah. thing you should think about is the Texas driver's license precedent. Okay, talk to me. Sons of the Confederacy, about a year or two ago, um, sued the government of Texas. Basically, the Texas government had this scheme for giving out vanity license plates. And the Confederates wanted a Confederate flag license plate. And the state of Texas said, well, no, that is offensive. We're not going to approve offensive license plates. And this wasn't an ad hoc decision. It actually was in the statute and the rules that you, the government doesn't have to grant disparaging license plate. So it wasn't it wasn't an ad hoc decision, but the Confederates took the case all the way to Supreme Court under the theory that these license plates had become a public forum. And I don't want to get too bogged down into uh all of the, the First Amendment precedent, but the idea was that these license plates were a public forum and that the government cannot have contest based content based discrimination or, or prior approval for speeches in certain forums. And what the government said was, like, come on, like, we don't have to give you a license plate, dude. Like, you don't get a license plate. And the Supreme Court sided with Texas. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that this, this is sort of in the vein of an issue that is not, you know, is only a year or two decided. It was decided about a year or two ago by the Supreme Court. And so I don't, you know, I don't imagine a 9-0 reversal of this Texas driver's license precedent. So I would say it's distinguishable, actually. Yeah, I, I, I too think it would be distinguishable because in that the the rationale for the driver's license case is that well that's at least partly if not more so government speech as well as individual speech. It's an official license plate, right? Yeah, there is no government speech by giving out. I mean, that's the gu- argument. One of the arguments the government made, but I, I don't think that the justices were receptive to the idea that that um, the government is speaking when it hands out a mark. Right. Is the government speaking when it hands out a copyright? It, it's, it's not like the, the government is speaking, I think, in the Texas context, right? Because the government is, it, it says official license plate of the state of Texas, right? So it does say state of Texas. Uh, and that is a license plate, which is at least 50% the speech of the state of Texas and 50% the speech of the, the sons of the Confederacy, right? All right, Tom, what's your second case? The second case is Nelson v. Colorado. Here, uh, you know that when you're convicted of a crime, sometimes you might have to pay a fine as well. If you're convicted, you pay your fine, and then on appeal, the conviction gets reversed. How do you go about getting that money back that you paid because of your conviction? Um, Colorado says, well, you know, this is our money when you get convicted. So if you want this money back, you have to file another lawsuit and in that lawsuit prove more likely than not that you are innocent and then we'll give you your money back. The defendant says, well, no, that's not how. All I should be able, all I should have to do is just file a motion at the district court and, the di- and you should have to give me my money back. I, don't have, I shouldn't have to prove I'm innocent before giving me my money back. I'm, so, conf- I'm confused about how this works mechanically. So you're convicted. You mm-hmm. pay a fine. Yes. Then you appeal. You yes. win your appeal. Your yes. conviction is overturned. Yes. Why is there another step for getting your fine back? This is a Colorado state law. Colorado said the way Colorado looks at this, you know, under state property law, when you're convicted and you pay the fine, that that money no longer is yours. It's Colorado's money. In order for you to get that money back, you have to sue and prove more likely than not under state law that you are innocent. That's like saying if you're convicted of a crime and you get a one-year sentence and six months in you win your appeal, that the government gets to keep you another six months unless you prove more likely than not that you're innocent. To me, this is hilarious. Like, this this is is absolutely Yeah, it's ridiculous and absolutely hilarious that the state of Colorado is even fighting this. Because I don't know how much this fine was, but do you think it's more or less than the amount it's costing the state of Colorado to take this all the way up and through the Supreme Court? I think the fine was $2 million. Ah, that's pretty good. (laughs) What's Colorado's argument? Uh, you, You can obviously tell that I'm a little biased here in this case. 
but I, I thought the best argument that Colorado has is the question is whose money is it, right? And when, when the question is whose money is it, it's a question of state law. And if state law says that once you turn that money over and it's no longer your money, it's, it's as a matter of property law, it's the state of Colorado's money, then you have to do more steps in order to get that money back under Colorado law. And, and Colorado went so far as to say, they could say, you know, you'll never get that money back. You can never get that money back. Um, of course, the defendant's argument is, well, this is a due process violation. If, you know, if, if a appellate court reverses the underlying conviction by which you took my money, then I should get that money back. What did the appeals court say? But this is important because we could have a 4-4 court on this. I think this is, this is, does this feel analogous to civil forfeiture to you guys? Yeah, it does. I, I, that's why I'm asking what the lower court said, right? Because I could imagine, I could imagine an eight-person court sitting there and thinking, oh, well, if we split 4-4, whatever the lower court says goes. And I could imagine if the lower court upheld the government's position that a 4-4 court being okay with that. And here's why. The overturning the government's position would have huge implications for the civil asset forfeiture scheme. And I'm not sure that the that there are judges out there that want to upset the scheme collaterally, right? Like you could imagine a, a really well laid out case bringing up civil asset forfeiture as an issue. But I sort of, I think that the Supreme Court would hesitate to upset that whole scheme, you know, through this Colorado law that seems sort of bizarre. Okay, so here, here's what happened below. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court reversed uh, below saying, look, there's no state law that authorizes trial courts to issue those refunds after a conviction has been exonerated. The only remedy that Colorado state law provides is a statute called the Exoneration Act, and you have to pursue the procedures under the Exoneration Act in order to get your money back. So the Court of Appeals upheld the government policy. There is no court of appeals. Um, oh, this is the state Supreme Court? The state Supreme Court going to the United States Supreme Court. Interesting. Yes. So the, the Colorado Supreme Court upheld the government policy. Yes. Interesting. All right. I am going to say that I'm going to vote that the court doesn't overturn the government's policy. And I, I think there are a couple ways they get there. I think they could have a 4-4 decision. And so the, the Colorado Supreme Court decision would stand. Or they might find some procedural reason not to rule. But I'm going to guess that the Supreme Court is not going to use this case as the opportunity to start upsetting the civil asset forfeiture scheme. I'm going to uh, agree with AJ, but strongly hope that they do use this opportunity to upset the civil forfeiture scheme. And I think if John Roberts has any desire to upset the civil forfeiture scheme, this will be his setup move, like the same way he did with voting rights. Right, where he took kind of an innocuous sort of Texas case that had to do with like municipal utility districts, and he used it as the setup to gut uh, Section 2, I guess, of the Voting Rights Act. And I think that'll be the same thing in this situation. Um, if he does, I, I, don't, I have no idea how he feels about civil forfeiture laws, but if he's as against them as I am, uh, I think this is the opportunity. So what, what, is your, what is your final answer, Richard? Sorry, my final answer is that it will be a... 5-3 uh, decision that will uphold Colorado's law. Interesting. As for me, I actually disagree with both of you. I, I think that I, I think the Supreme Court will reverse the Colorado Supreme Court on this and, and say that as a matter of, of constitutional due process, um, the state has to give the money back. Interesting. Okay. I think another reason why they might do that is that I, I do think this is a little bit of a corporate Supreme Court, as I've often said, and uh, this sounds like the type of thing that would benefit corporations that have had to pay huge environmental fines and things like that, uh, you know, in the past, and, and maybe they don't like that, and maybe they would like that money back if they can get those environmental fines uh, thrown out, especially if, like, you think Obama's clean power plan is, uh, is unconstitutional you know, or you're litigating things like that, uh, then you could see the companies that have paid this type of fine would want to get that fine back and would want it to be as easy as humanly possible. So 
the cynical person in me um, probably agrees with Tom, if for different reasons. Man, Richard, Richard is all over the map on this. You already gave your final answer. Yeah. You gave, this is your post-final answer. Okay, well, my final answer stands. No, 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 my final answer stands, not my post-final answer. Let's do the third case. Okay, for the third this case. This is really fun. This okay. is super fun. Okay, for the third, now, before we go on, do we want, how many cases do we want in total per episode? Let's keep it at three for this one. Okay. So for the third case, do you guys want a case on jurisdiction or a case on bankruptcy? Ooh, bankruptcy. Yeah, let's do bankruptcy. Okay, bankruptcy it is. So we have a case called Midland Funding v. Johnson. Um, in Once you file bank bankruptcy, there's this procedure where uh, your debt owners, the folks that own your debt, file your... A, a claim saying, hey, the, the bankrupt person owes me money. And the bankruptcy trustee's responsibility is sort of to collect all of these claims and figure out which is legitimate, which is not, and object to the ones that aren't legitimate. So in this case, Midland Funding v. Johnson, the, there are these companies out there that are buying up basically time-barred debt, meaning debt that is no longer enforceable because it's so much time has passed statute of limitations is run and you can't, you know, enforce it. And, and the, so they're buying up this invalid debt and then filing it in the bankruptcy court and hoping the trustees won't object because sometimes the trustees are so overworked or overloaded, they don't object. And so the, this is, you know, the, the manner in which they're going about and doing this is a violation of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, you can just assume that for the sake of this case, because that's what the court and the arguments did. And so someone sued under the Fair Debt Collection I love Act. this case. I love this case. <laughs> so someone sued under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act in state court. And these companies are like, whoa, 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 you can't sue. Your only remedy is to object in bankruptcy court. Bankruptcy is, is basically this area of law where courts have recognized, look, it's a federal thing. Federal courts are in charge of it. Um, federal courts have expertise. Tom, can I ask a clarifying, clarifying question? Yeah. Is the person suing under state bankrupt or state Fair Debt Collection Act laws or under federal Fair Debt Collection Act laws? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I can look it up while you guys are... Uh, uh, figuring out your side. Uh, the two, let me give you the two sides argument, right? One side is saying it's a very textual argument, right? And that's what the companies, what these, um, you know, uh, companies are doing is horrible. They shouldn't be allowed to do it. It's a scam. They're just hoping the, the uh, trustee won't notice their bad debt. Because I, th I think there's a certain time period in which the t trustee has to object, right? Right. Otherwise, it's considered legitimate. Yeah, and so the plaintiffs are basically saying, look, um, the text of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act says I can sue um, in whatever court. I'm suing in whatever court. I'm not suing in bankruptcy court. Um, we should just, you know, follow the text of the law. What, what, you guys are textualists. Let's just, you know, follow the text, right? The, ba the, the company's argument is, look, Bankruptcy court should handle everything related to bankruptcy. It's not like it's free money. The bankruptcy trustee still has this procedure to object. And if they object, we don't get anything. You know, we, we, you know, we go through that bankruptcy process and we don't get anything. So that, that's the gist of the argument. This is a super interesting case because, I mean, there must be thousands of companies doing this type of shit, And they must be doing it to sort of basically try and vacuum up pennies, right? And... So they're buying, the, I mean, I can just tell you what is probably happening. They're probably buying this debt for like a penny on the dollar, if that. And they're probably assuming law of large numbers that if they file these claims in enough cases, they get like four or five cents on the dollar back uh, assigned to them. And it is a total abuse of the system. This is very, very clever what they're doing. And I think it's, it's very interesting because there's no national solution to this other than having them be scared. Oh, well, there's legislative solutions, I guess. There's a change to the bankruptcy code, of course, you could do. Um, but there's no other solution 
uh, other than a court case saying that you can be sued this way, and then maybe that creates some amount of deterrence. So I don't mean to go too much into the public policy, but I think it's important when you're talking about cases like these and how they impact people. I think it's the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act. If that's the case, then I think the preemption argument, which would be the best argument that these companies have, would not apply. Yeah, and that's another reason why I believe it's the federal law. AJ, what do you think the court's going to decide? Can these companies be sued in other courts other than bankruptcy? Oof, this is tough. Um, I'm going to say yes. I'm I'm going to say that. I mean, this this seems like one of those cases where it it feels like policy is going to control, right? Because it's so it's so on the margins, and it it just seems like such a clear policy thing to shut down this debt collection practice. I'm going to say no, uh, even though I wish the answer were yes. I think what the court is going to say is that the bankruptcy code is very clear, and it says that all issues related to bankruptcy, including any claims would need to be addressed in bankruptcy. And I think another reason they're going to say that is they're going to they're going to use a bunch of policy arguments as well, but their policy arguments will be around the fact that you can't have satellite litigation going on um, related to bankruptcy that is not being decided by the bankruptcy judge. And here's another reason I think they'll say that. I think they'll say, let's say that the companies are committing some type of fraud, right? Well, if they are committing fraud and there's damages that could be owed to the person that is bankrupt, that those damages would have to go into the trust for the bankruptcy. So those damages could not be used by the um, by the bankrupt person, but they would have to go into whatever pool of assets that's being used to restructure or liquidate their debt. Right. So you can't you can't bring cases outside of that because then there's going to be money that's sitting outside of the bankruptcy trust that's not under the control of the bankruptcy trustee in order to relieve uh, your debts. I don't know where the court's going to go. My guess is sort of along the lines of AJ in the sense that I, 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 I and maybe this is just a hope, uh, but I, I, I think the, the court will say, look, um, this is a pure textualist issue. The bankruptcy code doesn't expressly, you know, knock these cases out. And the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act expressly allows these suits to be brought. So we're just going to let both act parallel to each other. I am looking forward to reading this opinion. I may even read the briefs. It's hard to tell how serious Richard is right now. <laughs> I'm being completely serious. I think this is a really interesting case. In fact, like Steph actually worked on a, um, she had a bankruptcy issue related to like one of the um, like kind of employment litigation cases she was doing. And the, the, the sort of broad layers of that situation was that you had someone that was uh, bringing um, employment litigation, uh, but, you know, like, disc, you know, just sort of disc wage discrimination or sex discrimination, I forget, or racial discrimination, I forget what the specific details were. But the defendants argued that the claim was waived, that you had waived this claim because the person had declared bankruptcy before. Um, and that while they w should have known that they had this claim and they did not disclose this claim to the bankruptcy trustee as an asset that they had. And as a result, they were stopped from bringing the claim later, effectively was the argument. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, oh, did we give our vote splits? Oh, I didn't. I think it'll be 5-3. I think there's a good chance this one might actually be a 4-4. Four, four. So I guess we should figure out what the lower court did, huh? Ugh, lower courts. I'm always fascinated by why the Supreme Court decides to take these cases, right? Like, which can be, I guess, an episode unto itself, although maybe it shouldn't be. But the, like, why, is the, why do you guys think the Supreme Court is taking this case at the edge of, like, bankruptcy law and fair debt collection? It just seems like there's... The national applicability or importance of this law or of this case seems so low. Uh, part of the reason they're taking the cases they do this term is they know they don't have nine members. So they're trying to take cases that are not as controversial as they would normally take, where they can get a majority. Oh, um, interesting. Sometimes, sometimes that doesn't work, and uh, but most of the time I think that does work, though. 
this is a for anybody that's not a lawyer or is not a Supreme Court nerd like the three of us kind of are. Uh, this is sort of like a helpful reminder that the Supreme Court does a hell of a lot more than just decide cases on abortion. Yeah, they also decide they also decide cases on uh, 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 the health care law. Yeah, and they also decide cases on like what can happen in a bankruptcy or, you know, what happens in certain criminal instances and things like that. Like the uh, I think just like the public gets very short shrift generally as to as to what the Supreme Court actually does. And I, I hope that after millions of people listen to this podcast, they'll have new respect for uh, for our Supreme Court justices. Ex- ex- except for Thomas. I don't know, dude. Thomas could be influential on some of these things. I think Thomas is gonna is gonna roll with me on that uh, on that trademark case, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, did you catch this uh, news article? Trump conducting foreign affairs in the public dining room at the uh, Mar-a-Lago Mar-a-Lago Country Club. I did actually, and you know what the the funniest thing about that was. Um, I saw this tweet from some of the folks at The Intercept about how they handle confidential information. So like when they have the Snowden documents, for example, everyone in the room takes their cell phones and goes and puts it on top of the refrigerator, leaves the room, and then handles the documents. And they were like, these people in the Trump administration were using, pointing the camera phone light at the document so they could see the document better. You know, if their phone had been hacked and someone's viewing through the the camera phone they saw everything that the camera saw i'm gonna ask the extremely cynical question do episodes like these play with voters do you do you think that this helps hurts or is neutral when it comes to politics i don't think the voters care they just don't care they uh i that's probably the the big picture or maybe that's the small picture but the big picture is it can be used as part of stitching together a narrative that Trump is magnificently incompetent uh, and is an American embarrassment, that he can't even figure out how to do very basic things. I mean, this is like the national security version of knowing how to tie your shoes. You know what I mean? Like if you're a grown man, you should know how to tie your shoes, right? And if you're president of the United States, you should know not to point a camera at uh, classified documents. I mean, kind of simple. Well, here's what I would say. I, I would say that, that the base of the other party probably cares more than maybe intermediate voters or the base of Trump's party, right? Like in the case of Hillary's emails, it was the Republicans that, I mean, really, really cared a lot. Um, do we know whether any of the undecided voters that swung towards Trump near the end cared about those emails? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think there's a lot of evidence that the Comey letter in October uh, had a big impact on the election. That a lo- when they poll people in exit polls and they ask, "When did you decide?" and there are tons of people that say, "Well, I decided back in February, right? Like I'm I was always going to vote for Clinton. And I'm a staunch Democrat." And there are tons of people who responded in exit polls saying, "I decided very late. I decided in the week or the two weeks leading up to the election." And Donald Trump one late deciding voters by some some very large margin and i think that the you know the comey letter has to be related to that well then what would you say to that i mean isn't this an example of the same thing hillary was accused of doing yes it absolutely is and i think there's there's two important points here uh the first is is that the facts are bad right or at least the allegations are bad, which was the same thing with the Comey letter. But I think the bigger, more important thing here from a political sort of strategy level, if you will, is that uh, you have, it's a construction of the narrative. So the Comey letter was another, let's just say fact in air quotes, in the narrative that Hillary is crooked and criminal, right? And I think this is another fact in the quiver of the argument that Donald Trump is incompetent. Like he just doesn't know how to do very basic things. He's incompetent, and I think that's that's the narrative. I think it's another it's another fact showing that Donald Trump is casual and um, off the cuff and extemporaneous in a way that is appealing to people that don't like to think 
very hard about their life or the world around them. Maybe so. And I think that it probably helps with his base. But, you know, this is sort of like I will go to my grave believing this. But I think there is a middle swath of the country that ends up deciding these elections. And they make they take about 10 minutes to make their decision. And that decision is, is fed by a narrative that is created that is, again, fed to them. And so the narrative, if the narrative is that Donald Trump is incompetent, and there's a fact that's coming out every week or two that they're just sort of casually picking up on that sort of reinforces that narrative. And then 10 minutes before they go and decide, uh, you know, who to vote for in that last week as swing voters, if they get facts that reinforce a narrative that's troubling to them, that's going to sway their vote. And that's, I think, precisely what has the potential to happen here is to say, listen, he's incompetent. He uh, doesn't know how to do very basic things. And that endangers our country. Uh, let alone, uh, you know, it, it definitely doesn't make us great again, but it actually makes us worse off. And, you know, it's a sort of, it's a there you go again, Mr. President type of argument, you know, what, uh, what Reagan did to Carter in terms of saying, like, you know, you're just, you're not in check with reality. I think that's how you win the middle. Sad. I'm sad now. You shouldn't be. This is really, this is good. I mean, you know, I think we're, we have a we have a pretty special moment going on in American politics right now, and uh, I think I'm really heartened. I actually, I mean, you know, I'm kind of by nature optimistic, but I think on top of that, I've been like really heartened. Is Trump is making himself out? I mean, he's making clear that he is incompetent, and I think over time, people will care about that. Tom, one of us heartened, one of us disheartened. Where are you at? I'm sort of in the middle. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Tom, what do you know about immigration? Do you, I feel like this has been in the news a lot lately. A lot of people are being stopped or detained at borders. The government has a theory that when you are stopped in an airport at primary or secondary processing that you're not quite being detained. So uh, that that has come up in some court case. I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but sort of what what do you know about immigration? Is there anything at all in the world that you know about immigration? Sure. Uh, luckily, we've we've learned a, quite a bit about immigration since Trump uh, became president. Um, you know, he issued that executive order. The Ninth Circuit issued a stay saying, hey, to Mr. Trump, you can't enforce this order. And then a district court in Virginia also issued another stay telling the Trump administration they can't issue, uh, they can't enforce the order uh, banning refugees for certain periods of time. Uh, in response to the Ninth Circuit, the Trump administration basically said, you know what, um, we're not going to appeal, we're not going to do anything, the president's going to rewrite the order to comply with the Ninth Circuit, um, and until that happens, there's nothing that needs to be done, because the orders uh, saying to the Trump administration you can't enforce the executive order it stays in place, and... Um, we're just sort of waiting for the Trump administration to uh, rewrite their executive order. Do you think that they are going to rewrite the order to have the same effect, but just remove the parts that are problematic from the court's perspective? Almost certain, yes. Richard? I tend to agree. I think that's precisely what they're going to do. I just think that I don't know how they rewrite this order, to do anything other than save face. I don't, I don't think it will have anywhere near the type of effect that they wanted. Now, the one thing they could do is they could just say, we're not going to impact anybody that has either a green card or has a visa or has been accepted as a refugee or given permission to enter the country, but just say going forward, no refugees from these countries. And I, I think sadly that is within their legal authority to do. Don't you guys think? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's probably the most likely route they'll go unless Trump uh, says something about how we're going to let in certain religious groups as opposed to other religious groups, which he did prior to the, the first immigration. Order, right, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think the, exec the executive order itself says that there's a preference for religious minorities. And I'm sure that there was some lawyer in the White House who wrote that and felt very clever about it and they say oh well this is sort of uh religiously neutral or just recognizing the 
the um, disadvantaged position that religious minorities have in certain countries. And then on the day that Trump signed the executive order, he says, oh, when we have that language there, it means that we're going to give a preference to Christians. And that I'm sure there's some lawyer somewhere in the White House that just started, you know, face palming vigorously. The really funny thing about all of this is that how are they going to defend Trump? Like, how can they continuously do it when there's a facade of uh, sort of legal intent that one has to put up even when they're doing things that may be illegal? And Trump just is incapable of having that facade, at least for more than like five minutes. I don't know, man. I think that's a good thing for us. Uh, Oh, hey, I think we need to disclose something here. Um, you know, we're talking about immigration. This is obviously a uh, topic on which all of us are uh, are biased. So let's 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 kind of disclose our bias. Let's treat ourselves like we're students at an Ivy League school. You know what I mean? Oh, I uh, I own stock in a human trafficking company, and so I'm sort of. Tom, what's your what's your disclosure? I'd like to hear more about the stock and the human trafficking. <laughs> I didn't realize that was uh, something well, that was publicly sort of, traded. Um, okay. It's not public. It's not like publicly offered stock, but you know, it's um, you buy it in bitcoins, right? So uh, that's AJ's bias. Uh, I guess I should disclose my bias too, which is that, uh, and this is going to be a surprise to everyone, but I am an immigrant. Can you say that again? It's a good thing we don't have a. Sorry, I know it's a good thing we don't have a student studio audience because there probably would have been gasps. But uh, I, Richard Shaw. Uh, I'm an immigrant, and the Shaw is not a, uh, it's not an Irish Shaw, so it's not a S-H-A-W either. I'm learning a lot right now that I sort of didn't, I didn't know, and I didn't know if I would be ready to know. So what are some of the things that you learned about immigration, AJ? Uh, actually, I found two really interesting articles, uh, j- just as I was browsing the internet during the week instead of working. And uh, so there, the New York Times and Ars Technica both put up articles about uh, covering basically the same topic, covering what can border law enforcement personnel search when you are crossing the border. And there is a, uh, a Department of Homeland Security paper that outlines uh, privacy and Fourth Amendment concerns when conducting border searches. And it, the paper was actually put out by in 2009 by the Obama DHS. And one of the things that really struck out to me is there's this U.S. statute, 19 U.S.C. Section 507, and it says that all persons are required to render aid to the government in conducting a reasonable search by a by uh, law enforcement at, at, during border crossings, and not rendering the requested aid is a misdemeanor with a fine up to $1,000. Some people think... Uh, under this authority, DHS can ask you for just about anything. They can ask you for the password to your phone. You know, you're crossing the border and you've got your smartphone with you and they want to search your smartphone history, see who you've been in contact with. And they can say, I demand your password. And it's a misdemeanor not to give me your password because there's a law that says you have to render aid to me in conducting a search. Do you think they need probable cause to ask for that? The DHS paper says specifically that these kind of searches are permitted in order to obtain probable cause. And so probable cause is not needed in order to conduct these searches. More importantly, do you think there that would survive a constitutional challenge? Because I, I know there's that case where New York tried to pass a law saying, well, look, you know, I know the feds can say whatever they want, but under New York law, uh, we're allowed to do warrantless searches. Um, as long as there are some certain criteria met. Basically, they were trying to rewrite by statute federal constitutional uh, search and seizure law, and the Supreme Court struck that law down as unconstitutional. I sort of, I don't know that the law is, I mean, so, so when you have constitutional challenges to laws, there are facial challenges and as applied challenges. And I'm sort of not sure that a facial challenge would work. I don't think the law on its face is revoking the Fourth Amendment. And I don't think the law on its face, face is sort of overly broad so that, um, you know, there's there's a doctrine that says that criminal statutes that are so broad that it would be difficult for people to ascertain ahead of time what kind of conduct is criminally culpable or not. 
that that those laws are overbroad and can't be enforced. I don't think I, uh, challenges along either of those vectors would really work. But I do think as applied, you can imagine all sorts of Fourth Amendment violations where you would, you know, there's a sort of a principle you can't punish people for exercising their constitutional rights. So when you plead the fifth, you, when you invoke the right against self-incrimination, juries are not allowed to infer from that invocation that you may be guilty, right? Because that would be punishing you for exercising a constitutional right. And it seems to me that, that making it a misdemeanor uh, to refuse to comply with an otherwise illegal search would be a, a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. What do you guys think is the most creative argument the government can make here? Because you know that they're going to be making arguments. Well, I think the search power at the border is, is extraordinary, right? It is, it is much broader than in ordinary, ordinary life. Tom thinks that too. I think everything that the government does at the border, or at least these types of laws, are like really troubling. Uh, yeah, I, I would also add that there's this case... Um, from the Supreme Court uh, called U.S. v. Flores, Montano, where the court basically held that customs officers did not need reasonable suspicion or probable cause at an international border to remove, disassemble, or search a vehicle's gas tank for illegal material, right? So if we apply that to cell phones, um, you know, the, the result is clear. What's interesting is that holding is consistent with this DHS white paper. So the DHS has a distinction in their paper between seizures and between um, and between detentions. So a detention is just when you hold on to something for a little while in order to investigate it further, in order to determine whether there's probable cause. And the DHS has internal guidelines for what, uh, how long you can have a detention and what sorts of things you can detain. And you can detain people, but you can also detain property. So you could, for example, tell a traveler that, oh, we're going to hold on to your phone, but feel free to enter the country and move around. And we're going to be able to hold on to your phone for some period of time. And during that time, we'll attempt to decrypt it and we'll make copies of it, et cetera. And if we find evidence of a crime, then we will seize the phone. Um, and you need probable cause for seizures and you do not need probable cause for detentions, which I think is like super fascinating. Do you know how long their guidelines say they can hold on to property or people for detention purposes? Uh, yes. Let me look that up. The reason I ask is because there is another Supreme Court case that where an international traveler was detained for four days, and that was considered a detention based on reasonable suspicion. Right. So the reasonable suspicion... You might actually want to talk a little bit about the difference between reasonable suspicion reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Sure. Uh, so, so taking one step further back, uh, the question is, you know, when can a, a police officer or a customs officer or, or some agent of the state come to you, AJ, and say, AJ, I'm going to hold this gun to your head. And if you move, I'm going to shoot. You, you have to stay right here. That's, they're stopping you. They're detaining you. They're arresting you. So those, this, those are different categories of uh, restrictions on your freedom, right? Um, and the first way they can stop, retain, detain you, prevent, restrict your freedom is if you give them consent. If the police officer comes up to you and says, AJ, would you mind staying here? You don't have to, but would you mind staying here while I ask you some questions? And if you give them consent, of course, you know, it's not really a detention, but you're cooperating with the police. Uh, when they either be a threat of force or show of authority, tell you, AJ, stay right here, don't move. That is a detention. And they have to have what the courts call reasonable suspicion that some wrongdoing has occurred before they can uh, detain a person like that. They can stop a person for a brief period of time. Now, what's brief? You know, the courts go back and forth, and there's a lot of law on that. And what is reasonable suspicion? Well, again, there's a lot of law on that. Um, the sort of historical definition in the, in the legal cases is that reasonable suspicion is when an officer holds a belief that is reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. And it's not really too helpful, but you can kind of see some examples of cases and, and see 
what reasonable suspicion suspicion is and it, it just boils down to this idea that they have to have some articulable logical basis to say you know i don't have proof but it sure seems like something bad or something wrong this criminal act is going on here now if they want to go a step beyond that and arrest you they have to have what's called probable cause and probable cause is concrete evidence of wrongdoing if the officer has probable cause, he can then arrest you, and, and that detention can be a much longer period, and that and the restrictions on your freedoms can be much more significant in the case of an arrest. Um, probable cause is both objective and subjective, so I, what, what that means is both the officer in his own mind has to have a reasonable belief. He has to be thinking, you know what, I, I, I have this evidence that AJ did something wrong, AJ caught uh, violated a law. And that belief in the officer's mind has to be objectively reasonable. That means, you know, people looking at the situation after the fact goes, well, you know, if I were there, that's that would be a reasonable thing for a reasonable person to do, basically. Can, I, I want to have a very quick digression. I think maybe the silliest thing in all of the practice of law is the idea that the reasonable person standard is an objective test. <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting, right, AJ? It's that, uh, let me make a digression from your digression, which is, <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, one of the things that the law requires, and I would argue, in fact, civilized society requires, is some of these necessary fictions, right? We need these necessary fictions, the idea of a reasonable person. We need the necessary fiction of, uh, we can sell arms to Taiwan, but not recognize Taiwan. You know, we need some of these kind of things that are, it may be even intellectually incoherent or inconsistent in order to sort of like live a modern normal life. And I guess all the reason I'm saying all of these things is because if you don't take the time to understand why those things are necessary, you could just be a guy um, at a press conference that lasts 77 minutes and just that just casually points out that everyone is stupid and everything is dumb and that none of it makes any sense and the world is a mess. So Richard, can I tell you something important? Yeah. The, the, the world is a mess. Yeah, but you could just say that and um, you could just be like, well, the world is a mess and I can fix it. I can make it great, but then not actually talk about anything as to how that would occur. So, you know, one thing, all the stuff that you guys have been saying about cell phones and about border searches made me think of my current, it's probably my favorite recent Supreme Court case as it deals with uh, privacy. And that is the Riley v. California case. Do you guys know about that case? Tell us. That is the case where the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, decided that the uh, that you you couldn't do a search incident to arrest if you were a police officer and seize a cell phone uh, without probable cause. And the reason that they said is they they very eloquently, I thought this is one of my favorite John Roberts opinions, talked about like what a cell phone actually is. So it, the funny thing about this case is the government argued that taking your cell phone from you is no different from taking a piece of paper from you. It's no different from, you know, seizing a piece of mail from you. And so the Supreme Court just sort of walks through why that argument is like so stupid. So I'm going to read some of this, this opinion right here. Uh, One of the most notable distinguishing features of modern cell phones is their immense storage capacity. Before cell phones, a search of a person was limited by physical realities and tended as a general matter to constitute only a narrow intrusion on privacy. Most people cannot lug around every piece of mail they have received for the past several months, every picture they have taken, or every book or article they have read, nor would they have any reason to attempt to do so. And if they did, they would have to drag behind them a truck (laughs) of the sort held (laughs) to require a search warrant rather than a container the size of the cigarette package. And I thought that was really helpful because it kind of demonstrated how absurd some of these arguments from the government are um, when they try and extend the law to a modern era where it just certainly cannot apply. And it, it makes me think that, like, we have a friend in the Supreme Court and maybe even in John Roberts when it comes to the government's modern day desire uh, to use old law and extend it uh, to, to be intrusive on privacy grounds. I just like a lot of the language that they use here, and maybe I'm becoming too obsessed over just the language, but I think this is the guidance that the, that the lower courts will certainly take. I mean, so at the end of this opinion, they talk about, 
how the revolution, opposition to such searches was in fact one of the driving forces behind the revolution itself, you know? Sure. And the writs of assistance, you know, where, it, and actually, in, the, in a way, this, what the, so the, do you guys know the writs of assistance doctrine? General warrants and writs of assistance? It was in the colonial era where British office, it was a crime to not cooperate with British officers when they wanted to rummage through your homes. <laughs> it was a crime. Uh, to, to, to <laughs> so anyway, I'm glad I just pulled this case up because that's, if I'm the lawyer, which I will certainly not be, um, that's the argument that I'm making is that they're basically doing, they're basically creating a writ of assistance and a general warrant at the border if they say that they want to search your cell phone and it's a crime not to help, not to let them do that. Sure, sure. I, I'm just not as convinced that Roberts is going to be the hero of Fourth Amendment issues um, just because I, I think it was just an easy case for him to decide that, you know, when there's a much harder case, for example, in the immigration context, yeah, then then we might get a better idea of how Roberts reacts. Yeah, I agree. I think I'm being an optimist here, but I think the uh, the parallels are kind of amazing. And I, I think it's likely we'll have a case like this before the Supreme Court within a couple of years, because DHS is definitely going to, I, I think they're going to be very aggressive as it relates to, to, you know, doing investigations at the border. In fact, I think, um, who is it? General Kelly talked about how like, one of the areas where they might amp up their uh, surveillance is uh, they might require people to uh, kind of provide documents of all their social media activity. Now, maybe they're going to do that up front as part of, you know, getting a, a visa to come into the United States, or maybe they're just going to say, we're going to do it at the border. And then there's going to be uh, some company that I'm sure develops technology, maybe AJ's human trafficking investment, if he's lucky, uh, that makes some uh, investment in uh, technology that can quickly scan and tell you whether after reading somebody's social media posts, whether they're a terrorist or not, I guess. Algorithmically, we, of course. What do we do if extreme vetting is just stalking your Facebook profile? You know, the I bigger think, question is um, well, how do we provide our podcast to the customs officials? Uh, because I'm sure they're going to want to hear all of it in order to vet us once we go back and forth across the board. I'm actually totally okay with them doing that, but I don't think they should be able to outsource the reading of my tweets or of my Facebook or, or frankly, of my of, of this podcast. I think there should be a human that has to do that. You know what I mean? Why? Just because I think it's more fair. Um, I think it's because that's the way the Saudis did it, Tom. Uh, you know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia for part of my life. And so as part of their censorship regime, I mean, this was a job creation thing. So this would also fit in with this administration's current policies. Uh they they manually read every textbook that came into the country. And there was a guy that would black out, you know, Persian Gulf in in your, you know, history textbook or your geography textbook. And he would handwrite in Arabian Gulf. It was pretty hilarious. <laughs> Let me ask you something real quick. Uh, did they manually read every single textbook? Yes. Or did they... Yes. So it didn't matter that they were copies of other textbooks. Well, yes, because who knows what kind of trickery people would pull. They might make you think it was all the same textbook, but it's, it's sort of like counting money, Tom. Just because you see a stack of hundreds, do you just assume that everything within the stack is hundreds, or do you individually count? And they did that with comic books, too. So they would, like, black out, like, all of the... Um, so if there's a comic book, like an Archie comic book, and, like, Veronica or whoever, or Betty were dressed in a bikini, they would black out the skin. <laughs> They would black it out, like just color it in with like, yeah. Sharpie? Yeah, yeah, they would, they would With a Sharpie, they would black it out. Was this like when you were living there? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's dope, dude. Yeah, dude. And I they want were, that job. Yeah, dude. Um, so you could get yourself a job looking at all kinds of like uh, illicit material or completely normal material, I guess, um, but that the government didn't want to. But the best really was how like my copy – of the of a textbook would have different handwriting that wrote in Arabian Gulf than like my friend's copy, you know, because like the per it's not the Persian Gulf in Saudi Arabia, it's the Arabian Gulf. Why didn't they just print their own textbooks? 
Well, they still needed like you to have textbooks, right? So like if you're in an American international school, you would want to like the teachers would want to import textbooks. So you had American textbooks and they were totally okay with you having American textbooks. They just wanted to read them and make sure there wasn't any material that they didn't like. You would think that this effort would backfire on children because as a kid, if I saw a textbook that had something blacked out and something else written in, I'd want to know what was blacked out. Yeah, it wasn't particularly effective, I think, uh, because it's not as if our teachers would, you know, they would probably still say Persian Gulf. So it was like, it was a bunch of half ass measures, right? Uh, I I don't think it really worked. So is it like, is it good that there are all these sort of, that that there are all these analogies between our current border policy and Richard's childhood experience in Saudi Arabia? Like, is that something we're like proud of or feel good about? I would say no, um, but I will say that there is one other commonality, which is the reason they did all these things. Uh, One was moral reasons, but the other reason was terrorism. This was in 1992, by the way. And so they required, uh, if you wanted to go from like the town you lived in to a town that was, let's say, 100 miles away, uh, there are checkpoints along the road and you would need to have travel papers. And so you'd have to go to your employer and they'd have to put in for you to get travel papers. So you would, you know, go and get the travel papers and that sometimes that would take a couple of weeks. So if you plan to go somewhere, maybe you couldn't go there uh, or you'd have to risk, you know, not having your travel papers. But nobody wanted to do that because nobody wanted to end up in a Saudi jail, uh, especially like with their entire family. Right. So the uh, yeah, that was they, they had travel papers because, you know, terrorism. Hey, can I guess can, I, can we go back to the topic of cell phones at a custom border real quick? One question that I wanted to raise is what happens if you're at, a, at, at an international border or the customs asks you to unlock your phone, but you have, for example, HIPAA protected information on the phone? I mean, so that, that is something that I read in the news. There was someone who worked for, for NASA in their jet propulsion lab. And he, uh, this, is, this is discussed in, I think, both the New York Times and the Ars Testing Hub. Ours technical articles, but basically he had these proprietary sensitive uh, information in his cell phone, and he said, "I don't want to turn this over to the government." And the government said, "Well, that's great. Let's hang out in the airport for a couple hours." And it was a genuine problem. Well, and you know, I mean, there's one thing with proprietary information. HIPAA is a federal statute, right, that says this information shall not be disclosed. Um, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that the this this um, this statute discussing um, the 19 USC section 507, the one about rendering assistance to the government. There is um, a there is a, a portion of it that says that a person who is reasonably responding to a request for aid under this section is exempt from any civil liability for the conduct done at the request of the government. It doesn't sound right. I mean, it's, it definitely it definitely sounds bad. All right, are we? Um, I think we're good, right? Yeah. This is good. This is what it feels like when it feels good. Yeah, I had a lot of fun too. I I think Mike Pence is very slowly making it so that everyone around the president has to get fired for some reason or another. And then this entire house of uh, cards, if you will, falls down upon, uh, upon the president of the United States. And uh, he is uh, impeached or forced to resign or something like that, while Mike Pence comes out uh, looking like a hero to at least some of the middle of the country that uh, will, will then love him uh, when he uh, is running for re-election. You know, you know what's the real House of Cards outcome, right? The Democrats win the House in 2018, and Hillary Clinton is named Speaker of the House. How can they do that? Doesn't she have to run for Congress? The Speaker of the House does not have to be a member of the House of Representatives. Shut the... F- Are you serious? No, I'm totally serious. Anyone can be Speaker. So you're <laughs> <laughs> Hillary, Hillary Clinton is made speaker. You're kidding. Of the house, you're kidding. This cannot be. Then, this cannot be true. And then Pence and Trump are both impeached. 
I really hope this doesn't happen just because I think it's bad for our institutions. But uh, wow, that would be really hilarious. I mean, that would that would be that would be some House of Cards stuff right there. And you know what else would be pretty special is it would be a great capstone to Hillary Clinton's career since her career began as a Watergate staffer. (laughs) 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 She made her name as like an extremely hardworking staffer on the Watergate like investigation committee that then ended up recommending that the president be impeached. (laughs) 